Hey everyone, welcome back to Brown Coat Nerd. Today we're going to be reviewing the Yugoslavian Zastava M48. This specific one we have here is the M48B. You also have the M48A, um, the base, you know, original M48, and the stinkiest of them all, the M48BO. And we'll go over the differences in those here in a little bit. Um, but first off, um, for a while, these have kind of dried up on the market, and just recently they started coming back onto the market. Um, this one was purchased several years ago. Um, I got it from a friend of mine. I believe he got it from J&G Sales. Um, and this is pretty much a uh, close to brand spanking new M48. And that's not real unusual to find these M48s in an unissued condition um, because they really just didn't use them all that much. So one source I will say, um, this book here, um, it's a good, there's a lot of good information on it. The thing that sucks, this is from the, the Collectors Only series. These books, and I've bought them before, and they usually come out in several editions. They're typically like, is there a suggested price on here? They're cheap. They're, they're typically not expensive at all. Um, like 10 to 20 bucks maybe. <sighs> this one apparently is out of print. Um, and, uh, I think the cheapest one I could find was this one here. It was 60 bucks. And I mean, it, it said that there was notes taken in and throughout here, there's different things that are highlighted. Um, but you know, it doesn't get rid of any of the information in there. 60 bucks for that. I, I was kind of surprised and I was hoping to find some information in here that I wouldn't find online. And typically these days you can pretty much find everything online. I did find some numbers um, in this book that I did not find online as far as like production and years. And I'll get to that in a little bit too, but the years seem a little wonky. So full disclosure, I got a lot of my numbers. And anytime I get, I'm quoting information from this book, I'll try to point it out. I'm not sure how um, accurate some of the information in here. Maybe that's the reason... This is no longer in print. I, I don't know. I don't know. So just so you know, um, this is a, a decent book. Unfortunately, if you're going to buy it online, um, I saw some of these like brand new going for 120 bucks, and I can't say it's worth that. I'm not sure if it was worth the 60 I paid for this one um, with all the notes and stuff in here, but I did it anyways. So the M48, basically what this is, um, Zestava had been making variations of the Mauser um, for quite some time and throughout World War II. Um, after World War II, and perhaps even during, I might be uh, wrong on that, but they even started refurbishing um, the German-made K-98s. Um, and actually, that's originally what I was kind of looking to get. Um, I kind of have a quasi-World War II collection, and you guys also know I collect a lot of Yugoslavian stuff for some reason. And I figured that'd be kind of a good mashup. Um, of the two because it's a refurbish and it is a K98. Whereas this a lot of times people will kind of try to call this the K98. I've heard people referring to this as the KM48 or the K48. Um, and that kind of goes back to Mitchell Mausers. I'll touch on that briefly too. Um, but this is a different gun from the K98. They do have differences. But basically after World War II, Yugoslavia just wanted to ramp up production and have plenty of firearms on hand if they needed it. Maybe they just had a ton of 8mm Mauser um, ammo left over. Um, but they started making this K98. Now it's, excuse me, look at me, there I go. This M48, not a K98. Now this is very close to the Czech VZ24. I've never actually handled one of those, um, but pretty much some of the changes between this and the uh, K98 um, the, the, the they mirror the M40 and the Czech VZ24. So the receiver links, some of the differences, your K98, um, and I don't have one on hand, so I was getting some of my information online, so forgive me if I'm a little bit off there. But the overall receiver length on the K98 is 8.75 inches, whereas on the M48, it's 8.5 inches. So the receiver is just a little bit shorter. Now the big difference is in the bolt travel, how far having to pull this puppy back sorry she's a little gummy i haven't cleaned her up since i uh flat shot her um the bolt travel on the k98 is 6.35 inches whereas on the m48 it's 
inches. So you got a little bit shorter of a um, throw there, which, you know, that's a good thing. Also, you'll notice, no, you won't, because I haven't gotten any shot here. Uh, so much easier doing handguns on this table. You'll notice there's no um, little takedown lever or quote unquote cigarette holder, if you want to call it. This does have the uh, cupped style um, buttstock on here. And you see it still has this same kind of uh, a sling attachment. I think a lot of thought to put this down without knocking stuff over. Here, let me just get some of my goofy random stuff out of the way there. Okay. Um, also on the bolt here, it, they both have turn down bolts. Now I have, I'm pretty sure I've seen some of these M48s with a straight bolt. Some of the other Yugoslavian Mausers, I think pretty much all of them had straight bolts. I feel like I have seen some M48s with straight bolts. Also, you'll see these at different kind of angles. I've even seen one that was swept back a little bit. Now, whether these are just different options as the stuff I played with, one was intended for sniper use, whether this is just something that Bubba did state, stateside, I have no idea. But on the K98, these bolts would come down a little more, and you'd have a little bit of a dish cut out of the stock here, and your ball here was completely spherical as well. Whereas on the Yugos, I don't think they come down quite as drastic as on the K98s. And then they've made this flat. Now, um, another thing is, I believe it was one of the ones with the bolt handle that was kind of swept back. I did see one, this had like checkering on the bottom. I thought that looked kind of cool. Once again, I don't know if that's something that, you know, old Bubba did, or if that's something that Zestava was playing around with. Um, so you have that differences in the stock and in the bolt as well. You also do not have the finger grooves that the K98 has. The overall stock, overall stock thickness on this is quite a bit thicker than the K98 too. It's a little heftier. Um, and then also this section back here um, is all exposed on the K98 where it's covered. The upper handguard comes past the rear sight. One thing I did find interesting, we're going over differences between this and the K98. And of course the, the nose cap here you can see is very reminiscent of the K98. The sight, I know on the early ones, on the K98s, would also have your uh, numbering here on the bottom. That way you could adjust the sight while you're prone. Later on, they quit doing that to the K98s. I was kind of surprised to find that uh, the Yugoslavians have carried that over on here. And holy cow, look at the cosmic that baked out while I shot this over the last weekend. Gugh. And that was bad. I've let it set for like a day and a half without shooting it. And now it's got peanut butter underneath the rear sight. All right, so there is that. And while we got her up, I'll go over the crest stuff later. Okay, so that's just kind of some of your differences between this and the K98. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is I see this so often people kind of trying to pass these off as some kind of K98 variant. And in the world of Mausers, yeah, sure. I mean, there's no question that this is, you know, definitely inspired by the K98, but it's kind of an evolution. It's a different gun. And what this goes back to is um, Mitchell Mausers. Now, when I very first got into surplus collecting years ago, I remember seeing their full page ads. And I tried to go and find some of my old magazines. I'm surprised to find I couldn't find any anywhere. Apparently, I, it's one of the few things I threw out. But they put out these full page ads. And I remember at the time I was looking all over for a K98. And locally, now the shops had them. I hadn't started doing the whole online purchasing yet. And um, I was kind of shocked at the price. And the reason is what they did is they completely refurbished these K98s. So if you're someone that's wanting to get like a surplus rifle, but you aren't really wanting to get it for historical reasons, for whatever reason, you just want it to be unique in that way but you want to use it as a target rifle or a hunting rifle. I mean, the Mitchell Mauser's not really a bad option because, um, I mean, they are completely torn down, refurbished K98s. Now, obviously, anyone that's into historical collecting, that's just like, why? Why are you destroying these things? And also, I, I didn't really get deep into it because I don't have a Mitchell Mauser, so I'm not concerned with it. This one was not imported by them either. Um, but I, it looks like there's some controversial questioning as to whether 
the way they finish the metal parts and whether there is stamps added or stamps removed, them kind of, it looks like they're, some people are accusing them of making K98s look more valuable or look more rare than what they actually were. Um, I, I don't have any input on that at all because this is pretty much the only Mauser I have other than my Arasakas, if you want to count those. Um, so I've never really dived deep into the Mitchell Mausers thing. I will say that once I purchased this, you know, I, you know, what everyone does, you get a new gun, you post uh, pictures of your new purchase. And I had so many people commenting on there, you know, oh, you got ripped off another Mitchell Mausers, you know, going on and on and on about that. And at first I was like, what the hell? And as you can see here, it's PW Arms. Here we go. Yeah, PW Arms. So this was not one of the Mitchell Mauser imports. But even then, as far as the M48s go on the Mitchell Mauser imports, the, they didn't mess with them like they did with the K98s. Like these these were never used in a huge war. I mean, they've been used in lots of conflicts around the world. There's no question about that. But Mitchell Mausers didn't really try to fake the guns. Now, here's what I'm going to point out. Because even when I first got into collecting, I came across this Mitchell Mauser ad advertising their K48s. And how did they... They worded it in a really funky way, like World War II design era Yugoslavian Mauser. They worded it in a way that you could... They were trying to sell this as World War II surplus. The M48s are not World War II surplus. They were... You know, production didn't begin until after World War II. And I remember even new to collecting, reading this, being like, hmm, that's... They're, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to kind of mess with you. That's some shady ass right there. So once I kind of looked into Mitchell Mausers, I came across people talking about that ad. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that crap. So um, as far as getting an M48, they didn't mess with them. I don't even think they refinished them. Like I said, a lot of these are available in pristine condition. Um, I'll see a lot of people talk about, and I never actually came across an article mentioning this. Although now that I say that, I do think I may have come across it in this book. But Yugoslavia, what they did in their program, you know, they'd make these guns, coat them up in a cosmoline and stock, you know, stack them in a warehouse. They didn't just leave it at that. Every like four or five years or every so many years, they would pull them out, completely clean them, um, you know, and then recoat them with grease and put them back in storage. Make sure there was no rust or anything. Could you imagine if that was your job? Like that's just all you did the same damn gun cleaning grease off slapping grease right back on god i would hate that so um that's why you're going to find a lot of these in really good shape now some of them definitely did get used like this one you know it looks like it just got some storage marks but the bluing is amazing on this you'll see a lot of these with some worn bluing um but for the most part they're in pretty good shape so as far as production now this is what i'm going to notate I got that from this book. I didn't really find that anywhere else. Um, production began in 1950 for the M48 model. Um, production numbers were 92,000. 1951, um, there was no production, or at least not a high number. And this book kind of touched on their having issues with like the heat treatment as far as metallurgy. Um, and I think they kind of said 1951 was the year they were really kind of Figuring that out. So back to 1952, um, production was 95,000, so stepped up a little bit from 1951. And in 1953, the production number was 93,000. And this was um, the first year of the M48A. Now, the difference on the M48A is just real simple. One, it says M48A on the receiver, and it's got a stamped floor plate. So here you can see it says M48A. Oh, but Baron Coat Nerd, I thought you said this is a B. I'll get to that. Um, so your M48As, your receiver is going to look like that. You're going to have the crest. It's going to say M48A. And then your floor plate is going to be ugly. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's just purely a cosmetic thing. It's nothing other than that. It's probably a little bit lighter, I would imagine, than the stamped one. Now, one thing while we're on this, I want to point out that's really freaking weird and when i bought this um the guy told me about it okay so here we go here are serial numbers the last three are two three six can't really see that six there it's the receiver 
And let's get her around to the bolt handle here. Two, three, six. I don't know how legible that is for you guys. The stock. Two, three, six. The floor plate. Two, three, three. What the freaking hell? It's numbers matching, except for the floor plate. That's three digits off. Uh, I don't know. I thought that was weird. It would make a hell of a lot more sense to me if this gun had some wear on it. You know, like if it was in use and, you know, in training or whatever. Somehow the floor plates got swapped. I would imagine when these are issued to groups, they're probably grabbing, you know, grabbed, grabbing grabbed in batches from Zastava, so there probably would be sequential serial numbers. Maybe it's like a friendship thing. Hey, I'll trade you four plates. I don't know, but this one's in pretty cr pristine condition. It would appear that it was never issued. So I don't know if the guy that was sitting there all day cleaning the grease off this said, God, I hate my job, and just would get a little snicker out of himself by swapping around a floor plate here and there. I don't know, but it's numbers matching other than the floor plate that's three digits off so back to production for the <laughs> so this basically looks for the most part like an m48a um, then in 1954 the production numbers are anywhere from 93,000 to 103,000 1955 they produced 103,000 to 104,000 and then in 1956 they only produced 40,000 now, the reason for the lower production number is they're switching over to the Model B, which is what this is. And basically, they just took that stamped floor plate and they ran with it. And like, let's make a lot more parts, a lot more parts stamped. So, all M48Bs will have a stamped trigger guard. And it's a nice stamped trigger guard. It's like a little two-piece. But you can see this ring here. It's got an insert. This like ring has been stamped around this outer part here. So a little lighter there, maybe not as durable, but you know, I'd say still pretty, pretty good. Um, I'd much rather have just the stamped trigger guard um, versus a milled one than the floor plate, just because I remember when I first started looking into these, I was like, I wanted regular M48 just to get away from that. Even though it's lighter and it doesn't do anything as far as function, it's just, ugh. Um, the other things they did is these end caps would be stamped, whereas on this one, I mean, I uh, I really have no clue if this is stamped or milled. The other thing they would do is, if I can get a good an angle here, these front barrel bands, the sling attachment, these also would be stamped. But as you can see on this one, it is not. This is actually milled from one piece. So I got really confused when I first purchased this gun. The guy I bought it from told me it was an M48B. Send me pictures. It's a friend of mine. Send me pictures. I'm like, God dang, dude. It says M48A right on it. How could you mess that up? And then I looked into it and I was like, oh, okay. You did it. So, but I was thrown off by this appearing to be milled. Then I watched Mishiko's video. Yes, this is my regular Mishiko reference that I do like in every video. Um, He's got an M48B that's just like this where it has a stamp floor plate, the stamp trigger guard, and that's it. And he says um, that he believed it was an early production um, in M48B, which would make sense. And this book says they had low production numbers because they were kind of slowly switching over to the B. So that would make sense for them to kind of do it a piece at a time. So under that assumption, I would assume that this is an early um, M48B. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. 1956 with the 40,000. I just looked at my notes again. Low production numbers due to preparation for the B. So the B would not come out until 1957. Um, so the 40,000, 1956, those are still going to be your A models where it's just the stamp floor plate. Then in 57, once they got ready for the Bs, uh, production definitely stepped up. Um, 351,000. Now here's the weird thing is I don't know if the book is screwed up because there's no more years after that. They went from like 92,000, 95,000, 103,000, 40,000 the slow year to 351,000 Model Bs. That same year, 
according to this book. They made 386,000 Model BOs. I'll get into what that is here in just a second. So, shat. That production just shot up. So, what I'm going to assume is in 1957, they started production of the B. For whatever reason, um, the total numbers just got jammed into that year. I don't know if that was a typo on the book part or if he was just going out of information he had. I don't know. Um, but... Yeah, so, like, so you guys can see, um, yeah. So, with that being said, also, with this one having the milled, um, barrel band, I would assume this was made 1957 or 1958, sometime in the late 50s at the very least. Um, unfortunately, you can't really get a specific year off this serial number, at least not in any way I've been able to find. Um... I read an article, it was either online or it was an article in the book, um, that said all the records were lost. Um, and I think it was from the NATO bombings in the 1990s, so, oops. Okay, so, there is that on the production. So, and now I mentioned the B.O., the stinkiest of them all. I was just joking because, you know, it's called the B.O. Um, what that was, that was a gun that was intended for export use. Um, B.O. stands for Bez Oznik. If I pronounce that right, which basically means, um, I believe unmarked or not marked without markings, something along those lines. Now, a lot of people will say, um, including Mishko, that the reason they did that, and a lot of times I'll hear people use the word, they scrubbed them off. I don't think they were ever put on there in the first place. So I wouldn't say they were scrubbed off, but they say they did it so that they could sell it to countries in the Middle East that maybe some of their allies would not be happy to find out they were, they were selling arms to. Excuse me. Now, while this is much like the Czech VZ-24, I feel like you could still look at one. The only difference between this and a BO is it does not have any crest up here or any kind of M48 BO or any mark. This is just, it's completely bare. It will have a serial number. Don't believe it has these markings. That's a Yugoslavian-specific, a... Uh, Get what it stands for. It has something to do with the army, I believe. Let me swap around here. So it won't have any of these markings. And I don't believe it'll also have this, which is basically like Factory 44, um, Zestava. Uh, I lost one of the pages of my notes, guys. It was only half a page, so I thought I could get through this without missing anything. And damn, there it is. I'm sure someone will leave, let me know in the comments. That's not a hard one to figure out there. But basically, it's Factory 44. Bandit also says it. So, I don't think any of those symbols were ever scrubbed off. They were never put on there. And like I said, a lot of people will say it was done, so they wouldn't piss off some of their allies to find out they're selling arms to this country. That was some different African and Middle Eastern countries. I don't know if that's really necessarily true, because like I said, I mean, like... You could still say, you look at this and be like, yeah, this was from, you know, Yugoslavia. What I, the reason I think they did that is because... And you will find some of these B.O.s with, like, different nations' crest on there. I, you know, like, when America started buying Beretta M9s, and, of course, yeah, those were made in the U.S., so I guess this isn't the best analogy. But, like, they didn't put the, you know, Italian flag on it. You know, you're going to want to have whatever nation the gun's serving in, crest or flag or emblem, whatever you want to call it. So I think that, and I might be wrong, this is just, I mean, I... I haven't found a single article backing me up. This is just something I've been watching going, you know, I think it's not as complex as that. And like I said, I might be wrong. Um, but I think it was just pretty much put on there so the nations could put their own emblem on there. And like I said, you'll see some of these M48BOs pop up that will have um, different Middle Eastern and African nations crest off, which I think is pretty cool. So that is the BO. The BO is intended for export only. Now, another thing, is a lot of the BOs were sent out with stocks. Some of them were also sent out purely with the parts, all the parts minus the stock. They left it up to, you know, whatever nation was buying it to supply their own stock. So you also see there's a lot of debate on what wood was used in here. That adds to the confusion. I'll get into that in a little bit. I've never seen so much freaking confusion over what kind of wood was made in the stock of a gun. Um, I think there's something else I was gonna say, but I forgot. So we're just gonna move right along. Uh, Yugoslavia being Yugoslavia, they love grenade launchers. 
Um, so they did have two different models. That was kind of a clamp-on um, rifle-style grenade launcher. There was the model 1951 Energa. I don't know if, I'm assuming that was the company that made them. Um, I don't know what year that was made. I'm assuming sometime around 1951. Um, and I do not know how many of those were made. The other model was the model 1960 that was made by Zastava. Um, and that one had production numbers for 1966. So I don't know if that means they were only made in 1966 or if this guy can only get the production numbers from 1966. Either way, in 1966, they made 20,100 of them. I've looked around a little bit. I haven't invested a lot of time in trying to find one of those grenade launchers because I don't think I am. Um, I cannot find diddly squat um, about them online or trying to source one of those. So, not holding my breath on that. Going to the stocks like I was talking about. So, most of these stocks um, were made from beech wood. Okay, source right here on the stocks because holy hell, if this gun has a controversy, it's the damn wood that the stock is made from. So, according to the book, they were mostly made in beech wood. Some were made with elm. All of the first series was made with walnut, so I'm assuming just the M48s, or at least the first of them. Um, and both completed M48s as well as kits contain the metal parts only for exportations. Well, that's like what I was saying earlier. Some of these uh, BOs would be exported with a stock. Some of them would just be a parts kit. So there you go. I see a lot of people saying teak wood. I did not see that come up at all in this book. And I've, I forget the guy's name. There's a guy out there that's got several videos on these M48s. Um, he's not one I subscribe to, so I don't know his single name. And it's been a while. I've been collecting information on this for quite some time. Wanted to shoot it a lot so I could give you guys my shooting impressions. Um, and I was almost ready to do it. Just needed to go shooting a few more times when this COVID crap hit. And so that postponed me, but I've been getting out, shooting a little more, so I'm ready to jump in with this one. Um, but yeah, there's a guy that's got a video on there, and he pretty much just completely knocks the teak wood idea. I don't, he, he knows about wood. I don't know crap about wood. Um, so yeah, what do you guys think? I don't think I got beechwood, elm, walnut. I have no freaking clue. And a lot of these two you will see cut. Should have grabbed my SKS. A lot of the uh, Yugoslavian SKSs, the wood grain just looks ugly. And, uh, like a lot of people kind of complain about that. And they were cut that way specifically, supposedly, um, specifically, supposedly, so that the grain, they were cutting away with the grain so the, the stock would just simply be stronger. And you will see a lot of these M48s that are cut that way as well. Now this one I kind of lucked out on because while it might be a stronger stock, they don't look as pretty. This one's got some nice grain in there I'm pretty happy with it so yeah that was a definite score this does have a little repair um the guy was probably snickering so hard after he swapped out the floor plates he dropped it and that did have to get repaired there um like I said I've taken this out shooting three times now not a whole bunch I would have preferred to shoot more but um I've been promising you guys this video for a while um it's fun what can i say um it seems fairly accurate i have am unprepared what did i do with those two boxes so i've shot four different kinds of ammo two of those oh they're still in my bag aren't they i cannot find right now no nope, they're not in there okay so i had two different kinds of ppu ammo I figured if anyone's going to make good 8mm ammo for this, it'd be PPU, right? Because they're in Serbia, which is where uh, uh, this, this is the Stava plant is modern days. And yes, everyone, I know Yugoslavia does not exist anymore. Every single time I make one of these videos, I have people commenting that drives me nuts. Okay, so what the hell is it talking about? PPU ammo, I had two different kinds, just their standard ammo, and then they had some like match competition grade in a gold box. It's gonna drive me nuts until I find those. They're in this room, guys. I need to organize. Um, both were, you know, neither one of them was horrible. I did notice shooting the match grade. Um, it seemed that I got curious, so I altered um, the rounds in a mag one go around. And the match grade, I felt like definitely kicked less, which would make sense. 
And I think it was like a dollar more a box or something. Um, not too terribly much. But when I was shooting, and I'm not a great marksman, like I've told you guys many times before, um, I do feel like the grouping with the match was considerably a little tighter um, than the uh, standard PPU. So, might have just been my shooting, might not have been. I also got this box here. Some old surplus. This is, yeah, this is this stuff here. Comes on stripper clips, which is awesome. It's with the uh, Eagle Slavian stripper clips. Look like this is one thing that bugged me too when I was first buying this. Is I started looking everywhere before I even picked it up. Look at that. Oh God, what was that? Eight hour round trip to get this guy? Um, I wanted a, you guys know how I am. I wanted specifically a Yugoslavian stripper. That's fun to say. Um, and, you know, a lot of places I was finding these, they were just saying 8mm Mauser strippers. They weren't really saying what country they were from. So, luckily, my buddy that I bought this from went ahead and threw in one box each of this stuff. But this here, let me get it without it completely getting whited out there. Assuming 1953. That's what this is here. It comes on stripper clips. Um, I had no issues with it, no hang fires. Everything went bang. Um, and then I've got this stuff here. These are different loadings, I guess you could say. Uh, I think one of them is, I want to say it's Sniper, but it's kind of like supposed to be more accurate, maybe match. Maybe it is Sniper, I don't know. I think it's this top one that's supposed to be uh, a little better. And these were just individually loaded. I didn't shoot a whole, I shot like one mag of each of these because I didn't have that much. Um, but it's all, looks like good stuff. You know, Yugoslavia, it's always brass case, I think. Most of the eight millimeter. Well, I actually, no, I don't know if eight millimeter Mauser surplus is coming to be in brass. Yugoslavia just typically always uses a brass case on their ammo. Um, this is also lead core, it's non-magnetic. So if got an indoor range, you know, this is definitely for to shoot, it's brass case. And the uh, bullet is non-magnetic. Now, it is still corrosive, guys. So, um, make sure you clean that. Don't let that fool you about it. Now, my research of this ammo, I did come across people saying there's, like, one specific year to avoid because, like, the brass was weak and, like, you're going to get the rim ripped off. And I feel like this one was, like, a year off. So, double-check me on that. I want to say maybe it was 1954. So, I feel like when I saw that video, I checked my ammo. I was like, ooh, close. Um, I don't know how accurate that is, but I've seen several people refer to that. So, I would definitely think there's some truth to that. So, just so you guys know there. And like with these two, like I said, I only shot a mag each. Um, this was also the first time I had taken this gun out. I couldn't really notice any huge um, difference. But between the standard PPU and the PPU match, um, I definitely feel like the PPU match was a little bit tighter of a group. Um, but I'm not the greatest shot, so maybe I'm just not consistent. Then you have these ammo pouches. Look a lot like the SKS ammo pouches. They're just a little bit longer. Of course, these were the original ones, so to say. You can get these in double cell or single cell. They will come in both. Uh, do they have a little pull tab? You know, sometimes you'll see pouches that have like little pull tabs. I think the SKS version ones do. This is not, there are two types of these, I believe, so there might be another type. With an eight millimeter Mauser ammo that does have a little pull tip. Then of course got my helmet out here. Um, cleaning kit. Oh, I had it. Dang it. My muzzle brake, which I was really proud. Not my muzzle brake. My muzzle. I don't think it's really a muzzle cover. It is I think it's more of a guide. Uh, you know, a guide rod. Cleaning rod guide. There we go to protect your crown. But you can't get like these little metal caps that just slip over here. And latch over it's got a small hole in there i to be honest with you though i like the idea of those and people might make fun of me and i know i always kind of well not always people usually don't notice but like if i take like any of my swiss rifles out or even my finish m39 if i take them out to the shooting range i put my muzzle cover on there like the finish one i think is the same deal it's really just a cleaning rod guide so you don't screw up this crowning but i put them on there you know yeah i put them in cases and the cases are padded and they're good cases but it's just to me a little extra extra protection on uh, not getting any nicks or dings in that crowning there. So that's what I did. Another thing to point out surplus wise, you'll see a lot of these 
missing that hood. So much so, I wonder if that was just a popular thing that soldiers preferred to not have that hood on there. You can find these hoods. They're not hard. Um, I've never tried to put one of these on, but I did come across the video where someone was like, yeah, it's kind of a pain in the ass. So try to avoid that. Typically, too, you'll see a lot of them missing the uh, cleaning rod. This is not a... I don't think it's a full-length cleaning rod. For some reason, I'm thinking it's not. It's got these weird marks here. I don't know what that's about, but... Let's find out real quick. Yeah, no, it is not a full-length cleaning rod. So you and your buddies, you just kind of stack your cleaning rods together. They screw in there. Um, so... There's that... And as far as bayonets, um, my understanding is any Mauser bayonet, or at least Mauser K90, I'm not sure how interchangeable the Mauser bayonets are across the whole line there, but I know the K98 bayonets will work on these uh, M48s here. This is the bayonet I bought on eBay. Um, this number is matching with the Bayo and the Scabbard. It's in pretty good shape. It's a little dry. Leather's definitely cracking a little bit there. But these bayonets are pretty cool because the blades are blued. And I know that's not unique to these. Um, but it's come on, that looks freaking cool. And this one looks in great shape, other than the one little discoloration spot there. But of course we've got to try it on so y'all can see. Boom. There you go. You got your black pokey thing. And I just, I'm glad too that this one's in good shape because I think this bayonet would look stupid if it had like a barrel that was like in the white or a nose cap in the white. So, luck out there. There go my notes. Ooh, ah. All right. So that is your bayonet, scabbard, and frog for these guys. But like I said, any, um, at least K98 bandit will work. Of course, the Yugoslavian ones are going to be cheaper, I would imagine, than the German ones. Okay, get that stuff picked up and out of the way. All right. So, then you got the cleaning kit here. Comes in this pouch, which is so freaking damp and moldy, I cannot get this thing dry. Get a little bore cleaner here, which if you got a Yugo SKS, Cleaning kit, you'll recognize those. Comes complete with the patch. You got this cool looking oiler here. Check this thing out. That's cool. I'm not sure which side is oil, which side's the solvent. But I thought that was pretty cool looking. Now I know there are some people that collect these things because there's always variations. I thought I heard something rattling. I'm not even about to open this right now. Um, so I have no clue how like how rare this is some of them are you know not nearly as common as others but that's pretty cool little oiler and then came with a bore brush um uh, whoops sorry guys so i got this pouch i think from liberty tree i know that's where i got the little muzzle cap slash crown protector um that was definitely from them I think I saw this and just ordered it. Like, I'll ever use it. But I just thought it was kind of neat with the little uh, canvas patch that comes in here. Yeah, that, which I won't bother with. And then, of course, we're going to need a bigger desk. Um, it's also the sling that I purchased. It has one of these little... Um, pockets attached to it just like the uh, SKS, Yugoslavian SKS I have. And it's got the brass oiler in here as well. So, a few other things I just pulled out here. This recently just showed up on eBay. Mr. Tito, a little silver coin and I'm not sure what we got going on there, but some uh, building. <laughs> Um, and this is close to World War II era, so I figured I'd just go ahead and pull out my allegedly counterfeit Yugoslavian Dinara. Allegedly counterfeited by the U.S. I've got a video on this, if you're curious. And then I had to pull this out. Um, this is a World War II era Yugoslavian banknote. 
Now, that's not an M48, unfortunately, but I believe that is the Yugoslavian M24. So I just thought that was pretty cool. Here we go. Look at that brave young soldier. So, I mean, if you got a Yugoslavian Mauser, you got to get a couple of these big notes at least, right? I think I've got like the 1, the 5, and the 10. Um, this one, I believe the back, no, I think the back's pretty much the same on the other ones. I didn't pull them out. So you can see 1944. Or for us, had not even ended. Isn't that crazy? Um, this is definitely the one in the best shape that I have, though. But I've got like a 10 and a 1, I think. It's pretty much the same design, different color. Um, it's got that same soldier's portrait with that Zestava Mauser slung over his shoulder. So I figured I'd just pull those out and show you guys. Um, but I think that's pretty much it. So um, if you're wanting, you know, to get a surplus rifle that's most likely in really good shape and you don't want to have to hunt around, M48s is going to be an easy go-to option. Now, I will touch on this, and I kind of have an unpopular opinion. I try to be understanding of everyone. I hate it when someone takes a, you know, unique rifle. Like, I knew this guy years ago. Uh, sold them a Finnish uh, capture. Uh, it was like a Mosin Dragoon of some kind. It wasn't a 9130. Don't know how rare it was, but it wasn't your standard run-of-the-mill 9130. Um, and uh, after I sold it to him, he mentioned to me how he was going to like chop down the barrel to 16 inches and get an Archangel stock on it. I was like, ah, oh, it's a Finnish capture, dude. What are you doing? Um... People like that, I don't really like. Now, uh, if you get a Mosin Nagant 9130 force match refurb, you know, and there's nothing unique about it, you know, it's not a Westinghouse receiver or, you know, anything like that, just your regular run of the mill Tula or Izzy. You know, honestly, pff, dude, have at it. There are so many of those out there, guys. If you're taking one that's a force match, that's nothing special or rare about it, there's plenty. There are plenty. I kind of feel the same way about the M48. Now, I know there's not nearly as many M48s as there are Mosin Nagant 9130s. The production number's way different there. But these weren't really used in any major conflict. Yes, they've been used throughout the world by many countries, as well as Yugoslavia. Um, you know, even during their civil war, if you go back and watch any of the news footage, you're going to see some soldiers with the M48 and the M24s. Um, they, did, they did definitely get use. But when you grab one that's like brand new, like some of these were sold with like the tag still on, you know, um, they were never used. There's like not really a whole lot of historical meat to them. They're not rare because, you know, almost new ones like these are pretty common. I, if I saw someone take a brand new one of these and like modify it, bub it, as long as it, you know, wasn't really screwed up the rifle or anything, which, you know, I'm sure people will be like, oh, if you screw up, touch it at all, you're screwing up. Anyways, I, I'm not against it. Um, so I think this would be, if you want, some, want to do something like that, this would be a good option. Um, it's not something I would do if I saw someone doing it. Yeah, I'm still going to cringe a little bit, but it's not, it's not as bad as it could be. <laughs> Um, and like I said, these are coming onto the market a whole bunch now. Now, the ones that I've been seeing coming back onto the market um, are M48s and M48As and M48Bs. I haven't really seen any of the BO models come back onto the market. There might be some mixed in there. I don't know. Um, but for the most part, they're all pretty well used models. They definitely have some bluing wear. Um, they're not, they don't look like the rifles that were put in storage and cleaned every five years. They look like ones that actually got used. Which, for a lot of people, me included, that is actually much more desirable. As long as it's functioning, it's not beat to hell. Honestly, that's more desirable. How I ended up with this was my buddy, he was kind of going through his collection. He had a pretty healthy collection. He was getting rid of some stuff um, to replace it with different stuff. Um, and so he called me up. He's like, hey, I'm going to the gun store. I'm taking all these guns in. This, he was planning on taking this one in, but he knew that I had my Eagle Slavian collection. And he's like, I, I can't just sell it without checking with you first. And then, you know, I told him I was happy he did because I never would have talked to him ever again if he had sold it without asking me first. 
and it was, you know, a, you know, pretty much an unissued one. Um, so that's not like really what I was looking for, but at the same time, I mean, that's kind of cool. I don't have anything that's in that good of shape that that's this old in my collection. And I needed an eight millimeter Bowser and it's Yugoslavian. How could I say no? So I got it. Yeah. And that's the story. If I ended up with an M48, I think this video has gone on way too long. I think I kept most of my ramblings at the end. I've been trying to do that so you guys can just, you know, click off when you're done with it. <laughs> but yeah, this is an all around good rifle, guys. If you're looking for any kind of a Mauser, you know, I've seen a lot of people kind of compare this to like the, uh, say it's like the M39 of the Mosin world. It's like the final evolution of the Mauser. I don't know if I could say that. I mean, Mauser actions are still used in modern firearms. Um, but as far as surplus, I'd say it's definitely up there, you know, or at least in the same category as the CZ. 24 it's my understanding is pretty much the same um so yeah if you need a mauser this is a good one if you're looking for some old surplus but something that's in really good shape um there's still plenty of m48s out there um yeah all around good gun i've been pretty happy with it i'm looking forward to shooting it more all right guys i hope you enjoyed the video if you did please like and subscribe and stay shiny